question to order. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mark Miller. He's with the chamber. He's the new economic person for the chamber. Thank you very much, Mayor, for uh, that opportunity. And I just wanted to introduce myself. I've been on the ground essentially since the Tuesday after Labor Day, so I'm getting my feet on the ground. Uh, and I'm looking forward uh, very much to working with all of you on economic development for the, for the area. Uh, I also want to uh, take the moment to, to thank you for your support for the position. I think that there are a lot of uh, very positive things about the community uh, that we'll be able to uh, expound upon and, and work on growing uh, our economic development uh, portfolio, our plans, and to work towards prosperity, uh, retain uh, businesses, and, and attract businesses as well. And uh, so there's a, a number of things that we're looking forward to doing. But I wanted to just take the opportunity to come before the council, introduce myself, and uh, to, to thank you for the, uh, uh, for the support. Uh, for me, myself personally, um, I have a long career working in, uh, in state government uh, and working with business associations, uh, working with uh, uh, agencies. Uh, and um, for me, um, I, I saw the job posting as a wonderful opportunity. To, uh, to come to this community uh, and to set down roots and to, uh, and to be a part of something very special. I think this community is fantastic um, and has a lot of great things. And uh, I, in so much as that uh, uh, we, my wife and I, Debbie, have moved to uh, Manistee, so we're inside uh, the city, city limits. Uh, we, we bought the old, uh, or the second, what's known as the second Canfield House on Cedar Street in the historic district, in the third district. And, um, and uh, we are, are, are hoping to, to make this our home. So I'm, I just wanted to introduce myself and say thank you and also to reach out. And if anyone has any issues to contact the chamber or any ideas, I'd be wel I would welcome working with anyone uh, and uh, moving this, uh, this community forward. So thank you for the opportunity, Mayor. Thank you, and we're looking forward to, I'm sure I can speak for council, we're looking forward to a great relationship and working together in the future. Thanks a lot. Public comments on work-related items. Do we have anybody like to comment on our work session items? Yeah. Please limit your comments to five minutes. Thank you. State your name and address, please. Uh, Ryan Fitzsimmons, 209 St. Mary's Parkway in Manistee and I'm also involved on uh, 70 Arthur Street, best known as the former North Shore Marine and RV. Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read you my statement so I don't miss details. But uh, dear honorable members of city council, I come before you today in the hopes to offer possible solutions or at least information on how to best proceed in awarding medical and adult use marijuana permits for the city of Manistee. I believe I have a unique perspective on the difficult task you have in front of you as a local property owner and someone embarking on a new business venture on Arthur Street. Um, I think that you will find that most of what I have to say is coming from my concern of Manistee rather than from my business uh, uh, endeavor at 70 Arthur Street. Um, a quick background, uh, I'm partnering with Meds Cafe in the hopes of running an adult use marijuana facility at the former North Shore uh, Marine, an RV. Uh, Meds Cafe currently runs um, a medical provisioning center in Roger City, Michigan. Um, where they are also in the final stages of getting a grow facility up and running. Um, I've been working with them to open additional facilities across northern and uh, <coughs> western Michigan, and it was my encouragement that brought them first to Manistee to open a second location. Um, it is through this process that my partners and I have done a significant amount of research, and by sharing some of our findings with you, I believe that the city of Manistee could maximize its economic gain while minimizing risk during this <coughs> vast task. Um, by setting parameters on how these permits will be rewarded, if done incorrectly, the city risks losing out on the economic gains uh, of bringing new businesses to the area. Um, if some of the applicants are turned away, the city would risk losing out on the increased property taxes from all the parcels, along with their redevelopment in the MSO district. Uh, the city could also reduce its potential revenue from the 10% excise tax on these marijuana businesses where 1.5% of the tax directly benefits the local municipalities in uh, areas where these establishments reside um, by turning qualified applicants away. Um, the city could further lose out on encouraging entrepreneurs like myself and many uh, other applicants 
who own or operate businesses outside of the marijuana industry to look at uh, Manistee as a potential location for new ventures. Um, unfortunately, for many municipalities across the state, setting guidelines that limit the number of biz businesses that come into these green zones have caused a number of these issues to occur. Uh, in some instances, uh, municipalities face litigation for perceived unfair practices. Uh, there are examples of this occurring for all types of systems put in place, uh, including simple caps, lotteries, and weighing applications based on criteria where uh, local property or business owners, uh, applicants with established medical provisioning centers, applicants with marijuana grow facilities, et cetera, are given preferential treatment uh, during the process. The city of Grand Rapids, for instance, developed an incredibly elaborate point system that took them a lot of time and resources to complete, uh, only to create more issues for themselves in the long run. Um, I would encourage the city to look at the number of applicants that they have uh, so far, um, which is 12, and see what properties could still potentially be available. Um, to my knowledge, it's one or two, including the former Michigan State Police Outpost. By setting the zone to include 21 parcels, you've already done well to limit the number of applicants and businesses. Uh, not all parcels can function as an ideal retail space, and not all established businesses will want to relocate, uh, including the, the hotels or motels. Um, additional limitations are set by the large amount of resources it takes for a business to come into the community to set up this type of business. Um, as you can see already, your process has done much uh, of this work for you and will most likely end up with around 12 to 14 ap applicants. Uh, these applicants are looking for various types of licenses, so not all of them are looking to run the some same type of business. The vast revenue that these businesses will create can more than support this number of applicants. Um, I would encourage the city council not to undertake the task of creating criteria to limit permits or licenses, as the time and resources uh, spent could ca cause large economic issues for, the man for Manistee down the road. If the council does not want to revisit allowing unlimited permits for adult use, um, recreational marijuana businesses, the same could be uh, accomplished by just raising the number of permits given out to allow the number of applicants the opportunity to get the permit they desire. Um, so long as they pass the stringent requirements handed down by the state and follow your uh, processes accordingly. Um, I was at the, the meeting um, when the council was making the decision to allow unlimited licenses for medical and recreational marijuana. While the second reading was voted through for medical uh, and the adult use was not, I believe the, this was the case for, for two reasons, um, or the, the issues. You have 30 seconds. Huh? 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, the optics um, for your constituents um, with medical versus um, <coughs> ad adult use is hard if the, the community isn't used um, to that type of uh, business in the area. The second reason is um, one of the early applicants brought up concerns that allowing unlimited marijuana businesses to the area would cause a great number of them to fail as the economics would not support them. Um, I have projected numbers that I'd be willing to share with you on a more timely basis of where the direct revenue or direct sales uh, and revenue by these businesses in the area would be somewhere between 20 and 30 million. If those numbers can't support those number of applicants, then somebody's done something wrong. Thanks Thank you time. very much. Is there anyone else? Seeing none, discussion on refuse collection options. DPW and Republic. Good evening, Council. At the request of the uh, DDA, the City Council created a ad hoc refuse committee uh, with the primary focus of looking at trash collection within the downtown district and then with the secondary of looking at trash collection citywide. That committee's met uh, several times, has come up with a recommendation which the DDA accepted, and that is to put two uh, trash corrals or dumpster corrals in the downtown district between US 31 and Maple Street. Uh, the DDA has also uh, voted to fund the construction of those up to $80,000. So we've got the uh, designs for the two, for two of those corrals uh, just about completed. We're in the final review stages and then city staff's working on an ordinance uh, that would assist in implementing that. The Refuse Committee then turned to the second task, which is looking at uh, trash collection citywide. And uh, through lots of discussion and after looking at models and how other communities uh, handle trash collection, 
they have um, proposed a citywide uh, cart usage. And do you have that spreadsheet, Heather, you put up? The reason for the uh, citywide, the primary reasons for that would be, number one, uh, would assist in, in the cleanliness of the community when bags are put out, um, you know, they're often subject to animals, wind, blowing stuff around. Um, the carts create a, a very consistent look. It also helps with the compliance. Uh, right now we've got a three-tiered system. And when those, in those three tiers, the first tier is the mini, which is one to two bags per week. The second tier is the regular, which is four to six bags per week. And then the current uh, tote system. Uh, last year when we asked Republic to do an audit of those, we found that there were quite a few um, residents that were using a higher level than what they were paying for. And as you're aware, this is an enterprise fund, so um, the city's responsibility is simply to take the costs that are uh, of, of running these programs and making sure that the charges that we, um, that we determine for the users pays for those same services. The other, uh, the other benefit is there's automation um, when you go to the 100% the cart system around town. So the more automation that's in place, uh, the less manual labor, and in theory over time that should help stabilize um, the cost increases. So up on the screen, um, up on the screen, Up on the screen isn't the whole page, so we'll get the whole page up on here. But basically what we've looked at is the service level, that's a little bit harder to read, but the service level is over on the left hand side, and you've got the mini, uh, the regular, and then the tote. And then we've got the cost as, uh, there's a cost column of what that costs today. And what we really wanted to look at was uh, the, the column under option one which is what we anticipate the cost would be on July 1st next year. So at the be beginning of the next fiscal year for the city. And those numbers were derived through discussions, uh, preliminary discussions with Republic Services. But we anticipate next July that the mini service would be uh, $6.27 per month. The regular, uh, which is the four to six bag, would be $12.54 per month. And the tote would be eighteen ninety seven, just under $19 per month. If the city council chose to go tote citywide, the cost for the tote for every residential customer would be 1921. So just a little bit more, you know, about a 25, or 25 cent increase over what the toast cost today. However, that becomes more substantial when you compare it to the tote cost versus uh, the 627 of the mini and the 1254 of the regular service. So recognizing that the uh, ad hoc committee wanted to also explore a third option, which would be adding a bag system where you could purchase a refuse bag, uh, a city of Manistee refuse bag. And we anticipate the cost of those bags to the residents would be about $2.50 a piece. So if you were putting out one bag per week, in a month, your monthly uh, cost would be $10. If you're only putting out one every two weeks, um, then your cost would be $5 a month. Those bags are 30 gallon bags, so there's a lot of capacity in them. They're much larger than what just your, um, you know, your kitchen trash bags are. If we did that option three, um, we assume that about half of our, our customers would probably start out with the bag option because it, it becomes a pay-as-you-throw model where you can control the cost of your refuse by how many bags you're putting out on the curb and you simply buy the bags that you need. Um, the rest of the city uh, would likely go to the cart system. Actually, what we would do is make this as a, everybody is required to have a tote. You have the ability to opt out of the tote, so you could call City Hall, opt out of that tote, and then you could replace it with you know, purchasing those bags. Knowing that there's less of those totes in the city raises the cost a little bit, but we're projecting that that would be at 1977 per month. 
so the uh, the ad hoc refuse committee uh, asked that this be brought before council at a work session to uh, get your feelings and input on each of those three options. Input? Well, for myself, I can tell you that I use a garbage can, a big, large garbage can, can and I usually put two 30 gallon bags in there a week on average. So then I would be forced to use a tote, is what you're telling me, which I don't have room for. You would use a tote. Which I don't have room which for. Which would be about $19.77 a month. Or you could purchase the bags, but the bags would essentially cost you $5 a week or $20 a month. So the cost would be about the same, but that's kind of the, where the break point is. If you're using two 30 gallon bags a day, um, a you're week. at that, um, or a week, I'm sorry. Right. You're, you're at that break even point with the cost of what the total would be. And in discussions um, with Republic, the, early on we think that people would, would opt out of the tote, but eventually as they started using, um, using those bags, they would, they, a lot of people would realize that um, it's more cost effective and cleaner to, to go to the tote system. However, that does give an option for people that are on fixed incomes and, and have a lot less um, refuse to put out. I like the idea of having both both options. I do like the, the bags, being able to purchase the bags. It help, like you say, it helps that person who maybe only puts out a little bit once a month. Um, it, it helps them out, so it's kind of a catch-all for everybody. Gives everybody an option. Anybody else have any opinion? Yeah, I use, if I even use one of those small kitchen heavy-duty bags, I don't even need it every two weeks. So tote doesn't do me any good. And, and if it's two fifty for a bag, I mean, I can buy the other bag. I'm not really using half of the bag. I know there's a lot of people that I've talked to that, I mean, older people don't even have anything to put in the bag almost. But you don't have to put the bag out every week. Correct. You can, you can put your stuff in it and it can sit there for a month until you fill it up and set it out the next haul, is that right? You can take it out to the curb whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready. It doesn't well, have to go. Until then, do you bill every week or is that they're going to pay for that service every week? When, when we came up with these numbers, we took what the base collection fee would be from Republic, so we know what that's going to charge, and then we broke it down into um, how we would have to separate those out. So we know what the cost of the bag would be from Republic to us, right. and then we know what the cost of the cart would be. and so. Um, Ed keeps a very detailed spreadsheet as we run through the revenues and expenses to make sure, because you have to remember this is an enterprise fund, so we are just simply trying to cover the cost of the program itself. So, excuse me, just, so, I so, think the So if you had the bag option, you would not receive any additional billing. Okay. The only cost you would have is when you go to the store or City Hall or wherever we decide that those would be for sale, and you could buy about four bags at a time for $10, but you don't actually, you put them out as you use them. Any other questions? You got it? Well, I, I'm, I was just trying to run some numbers, but uh, this is a big increase for 1,500 of our customers. We're talking about, you know, a 370-some percent increase in their garbage collection fees. Uh, I think that's, that's a little bit of a shock. Uh, you're talking about uh, going from $8,977 a month to $31,137 a month for those 1,575 customers. So that's basically over $3 million or, well, give or take, done the math, a little over $3 million a year versus $900,000 a year. Right? Did, and, and again, I didn't have any time to really look at those numbers, but. Can I clarify something? Sure. So if you look at the, the bottom of the spreadsheet where it says today, mm -hmm. 
for the residential pickup, the cost was about 28,000 a month. Okay, so what Republic is telling us is when we negotiate the new contract, they're likely to have about 11% increase. So that would take it from 28 to about 31. So that's approximately $3,000 a month. So it's about a $36,000 a year increase is overall for the service. So but, but what I'm saying though, is if you go from a $5.70 charge for the mini to a $19.77 charge for everyone being required to have the, the big container, that's what I'm talking about. The Absolutely, that's a very large increase. However, most of the people that are using the mini service aren't going to get a tote. They're probably just going to buy their bag because that's why they have the mini service right yes. now. They're putting out one, maybe one bag a week, maybe one bag every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And so this was, I think, an attempt to try to split that difference where you, it makes efficiencies, it makes the town cleaner, which was a goal of the committee, but it also gives an option for the people that use you know, much less garbage to be able to buy a bag and put it out when they want. And they control that you know, to a degree. Um, but it, it, you know, you've got to spread these costs are what the costs are from the, the vendor. They're just being spread different ways. And another thing to keep in mind is too, it, part of this is being paid by a millage. So the millage raise is about $200,000 a year. Um, in the past, the millage was the vast majority of, of what the garbage bill was. And then councils have said, we don't want to raise the millage anymore. We want to just keep increasing the monthly rate. And I'm not suggesting that council should do anything with the millage, but what I, my point is, if you wanted to control the costs on that, that would be an option as well. Um, you know, the mini service right now is very economical, but I, I think what Republic has found is that that is sometimes being abused, and sometimes the regular service is being abused, and short of them basically having a checklist that they go around to every house every time to kind of enforce that, which isn't practical for them, it, it becomes difficult, and, and everybody ends up subsidizing that this way, if they have to buy a bag, they're only gonna collect a yellow bag that's out at the side of the curb. That's it, if they put out a black bag or whatever, and we know that they're paying for that. So those, I think, were some of the considerations. Well, here's a question. I, I really don't have room in my garage for this huge tote, but if I buy the bags and put them in my garbage can and put it out in the curb, are they gonna pick them up? I mean, I've already paid for the bags. Correct, yep, as long as they're the branded bags, yep. Okay. Councilman Szymanski, that's, I think the point that you were trying to make is um, what the ad hoc committee, where they got to, mm -hmm. is that option two, while they felt was the best for the community, economically it didn't fit. And that's why option three it's was the bad call. Right. <coughs> Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much, gentlemen, unless you have further. So do we have any sort of consensus on? I like, the, I like the three options myself. Option three? I like option three with the tote being an optional, but they can get the bag. That's what I like. You can speak up, you don't have to. Should we, should we bring this to a, a council meeting for action? <coughs> a bag? <coughs> What's that, certainly. Do you have a bag with you? I thought you said, could you bring it? See. <laughs> do you want it? Do you want staff to bring this uh, up at a council meeting so you can take action? Is there anyone against it at this point? <laughs> well, we don't have numbers on it. Yeah, we just got this right. so. The formal proposal would come back with you with the numbers. What happens if we didn't do anything? I'm sorry? What if we just say that kept it as status quo? Sounds like it us. So then that's what we, we need to know that. So we're setting up, part of what this ad hoc committee is doing is, is studying the different options and we're doing this ahead of when we renew the contract uh, with Republic. So our expectation would be that whichever way we go, we would roll that into the next contract and then implement next year. If we stay status quo, how does our enterprise fund look? Well, the enterprise fund is looked at in every budget year and the rate increases that we roll out each year are set to cover the increase in the costs. So I, we're at a 11% increase is what we're currently at. Right now. Well, if we don't do anything, we're getting 11% increase. Regardless. Regardless. Okay. 
But, but it looks like with the totes and the bags, the increase is more than if we just go with the status quo. Yeah, to get additional, additional cart deployments, yeah. Yep. And then each year we evaluate on if we brought in more revenues than we had expenses in, that current, in the current fiscal year, and that's how we're projecting it out, then the increase for the following year is less. If we end up close to a deficit or if we don't have enough fund balance, then the increase obviously gets adjusted more. And as I understand, the carts are, the totes are actually owned by Republic. They're just basically part of a long-term lease. Correct. Yep. I don't know what percent of the of our citizens put out a very little every week. It's right there. It's 1,575 residents. They put out a very little? Yeah, it says many per visitor. Okay, I didn't see it. Okay. But anyway, well, those, pe those people, to me, would benefit from a bank. The bank purchase. They might. Well, they would they actually be less for them. If, if they're abusing yeah, it, they $3, probably $3, would. Yeah. Revenue. Yeah. Where the $3,000 most. But, right, but if you look at status, at, at, uh, the status quo, their increase would be from 570 to 627 yeah. versus potentially $10 with the bags. So even that's, you know, that's like double 40% increase. I, my opinion would stay as status quo because I wouldn't want to increase rates. I mean, 11%, but more than that, I don't think would be right. Anybody else? Mr. Cooper. I feel the same way that Aaron and uh, yeah. <laughs> you were telling me that. Aaron Pro Tem, do you have any, any ideas? I don't. I haven't decided no. between, honestly, between one and three. Okay. Cents. I need to look at it a little bit more, too. Okay. Just four. Okay. Another option, to, or what I'm thinking is with the bags, we didn't accumulate this trash as we should have. Um, you're still gonna have a problem with odor and animals. That's just what I'm thinking. Well, that's why I asked the question. I thought about that too, but my garbage goes into a garbage can. That's, I have a full bag inside the house that goes into the garbage can and the garbage can goes to the street once a week. I just don't want a huge tote. <laughs> I guess there's a, the other question would be, is there a a secondary size tote? Do you have to go, because the, the tote's got to be what, 100 gallon or? I mean, uh, yeah, it's a 96 gallon tote. Okay. The next size down, the 65 gallon tote has the exact same footprint in a garage. Does it doesn't save you any space. It's a little shorter and a little narrower. What about cost? The, the cost of it's minuscule. It's about 75 cents. Okay. What about staying status quo and still having the bag program? You could do that. You could remove the mini and put the bag program in place of the mini. We could put that back to you as a proposal. And that was discussed at the committee level. Um, however, it did not it did not achieve the the goal of cleaning up the community. Um, it does help with <laughs> compliance issues certainly, um, but it also doesn't uh, help with the automate auto automation for the collection. Which is where the industry is headed. So, what did the ad hoc committee recommend? They recommended option three. <coughs> Anything else? Next, rising tide update. What's that? Good evening, Council. Thank you for having me tonight. All right. So we have a. Okay. I do have one. 
All right, so as you know, my name is Lisette and I'm your Community Development Fellow for Project Rising Tide. Um, thank you for having me tonight. I'm gonna bring you a little update of where we're at with some of the projects that were specified for Project Rising Tide in Manistee. Um, I'm hoping to get your feedback in any of these projects for tonight. Uh, just this morning, we decided to look at these projects as official documents to possibly adopt them uh, by the city in October. And you know, I think it's the best time tonight for you to give me any feedback. I can cover any questions, or we could just really move forward with the recommendations and results that have come out, come out of my time here in Manistee. Okay, so as you know, I'm just gonna try to keep it very simple and quick. Uh, Project Rising Tide has specific initiatives in Manistee that were, that were selected by a steering committee in the community. I'll move a little bit uh, further down here. I think this right here. Okay, so Project Rising Tide has a steering committee that kind of helps me steer like my day-to-day, uh, -day, the activities that we have, the project deliverables, and then in that steering committee we have the Manufacturers Council, Manistee County, Chamber of Commerce, the Intermediate School District, the City of Manistee, the DDA, the Munson Hospital, Blarney Castle, uh, the Tribe, MEDC, the Community Foundation, and other really local organizations that have either helped me or that I've been a part of their initiatives and have given me feedback with my time here in Manistee. Um, Jesus, what is happening? Oh, sorry. Here, we had four initiatives selected for Manistee as the key projects. One was economic development handled by Place and Main Advisors. Uh, the whole point of that strategy was to <coughs> kind of work with all of the community stakeholders to define a clear path for economic development. Uh, Manistee is pretty small, but it seemed that a lot of organizations were working in a lot of different directions at the same time, achieving, lead, you know, not as much as, not, not being as effective as they could be. Uh, second was a component of board training and development, which is still on the works of providing some training to our local boards on how can we be more successful in decision making and working with each other. Uh, the third one was a branding and marketing component that many of you have either ta talked to me about the presentation or attended the presentation, but a lot of it was providing material and an image for the city of Manistee, for the community to identify themselves. And then the fourth one, housing. Uh, we also have our housing consultant here today, Sarah Lucas, and she'll talk to you all a little bit more about the housing approach and the proposed approach, really, for Manistee. These organizations here are the consultants that were hired through the state of Michigan to work with these initiatives. So Beck and Rader is the lead consultant that manages all the other ones, placed in Maine for the economic development, um, Arnetta Muldrow for the branding, and then Housing North for our housing initiative. If you have a question as I go through, please feel free to stop me and I'll be uh, happy to cover anything. Um, a lot of my role, I have a, an office here at the City Hall, I do, you know, a lot of different things every day, uh, but for the most part, I think it's focused in conducting outreach and promotion for any city initiative. So I'll go out there wherever I can to promote the things that you guys are doing as a city, kind of the things that you are engaging up with the redevelopment ready certification, uh, represent the city in events, any training, any you know, uh, forum, any, any activity even outside of Manistee. Uh, host events, connecting the community to the city and some of the things you wanna achieve uh, connecting the city to programs, resources, and trainings, uh, even arranged training for, for the community. Uh, we hosted the incentives one-on-one -on -one with MEDC. I also have on the works a training with MISHTA to come down to Manistee and talk about down payment assistance, loans for home rehab, and kind of different ways that MISHTA can be used to either acquire a home or work on, on, on your own. And then implement the Project Rising Tide recommendations. So the economic development will be the first one. We held a very successful meeting at the Vogue Theater sometime in February. We had over 80 people. Uh, this was the result of the SWOT analysis we conducted with the community in which we asked them to identify the strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats of the community. Uh, the strengths obviously are the natural resources and the Ramsell and Vogue Theater. Uh, the opportunities are housing. It's kind of the bigger deal across our state in general. Weaknesses are lack of community uh, collaboration and then the threats, negativity. I feel that my day to day, it's kind of focused in working with those things that were identified by the community in February uh, and with the hopes that the economic development plan also tackles some of these things. This is just a little summary of the key data that we had to work with as we 
kind of got together the plan for Man of Cecil, the, uh, the average age, the income, the population, et cetera. Those are all things that matter whenever you're gonna, about to implement the economic development plan. Joe Borstrom focused the economic development strategy in five things. So how do we work with the talent of our community? How do we develop and kind of work a lot more with our industry? Uh, continue to support the tourism, uh, build in our place, in our community in itself, build from inside, and then supporting uh, entrepreneurship. The main thing he recognizes the biggest challenge for Manistee is population recruitment. How do we work towards bringing people permanently to you know, move and live in our community, uh, working to market the vacant industrial sites that the city has, uh, kind of work on a vertical cluster strategy. So how do we talk with our industrial companies right now to kind of target or identify what could be another industrial company that already serves you or that you buy from that we could clearly demonstrate as a community that there's a demand to bring them down here. Um, working with the County Visitors Bureau on shoulder season and meet with tourism development, uh, housing, and then entrepreneurship. And the entrepreneurship of working more with our current businesses and organization of offering training and connecting them to resources. What, what can the community provide to make your businesses or to give you more opportunities to open a business here? And then the concept of Manistee Forward, which I'll explain in a little bit. I added an example in the presentation of how the recommendations were made by the consultant to the city. He added specific action items with, uh, tied with your master plan as a city and then added specific responsible parties and uh, partners to implement those action items. I won't go one-to-one one one on them because we'll probably stay here all night. Um, the other concept that came as part of all of this discussion as we try to talk about tackling negativity, lack of communication, and lack of collaboration was establishing a, a team called Manistee Forward, a way to have the different lead organizations in the community to just really communicate and be able to make decisions as community. Uh, just this morning, I met with the steering committee to kind of set up a date for this idea. This is supposed to start as a trial effort for Manistee on October 8th, hopefully having the chamber, the city, the county, the DDA, the schools, and the community foundation really collaborate and talk so we could be on the same page of what everybody has going on. The other project was the branding. I'm just really gonna provide a, an image of what the consultant suggested as the image for Manistee. Uh, it was Manistee, Michigan, Soul of the Water, Spirit of the Woods. Uh, he suggested different taglines for the different initiatives and things that are happening in the community. So natural resources, economic development, the, uh, the Visitors Bureau, and then Manistee, the local pride in the city uh, packages or information. He developed something for the marina to use. Um, all of this content, will it's already available as of yesterday to all of the community. I just need to work on to spreading it out for everyone to have access to it uh, and use it however they can. Uh, he provided also ideas for the wayfinding and ways that we could work to advertise Manistee a little better to kind of have a visual representation of what Manistee is as a community. Uh, he also proposed some banners and ideas uh, I think that the most valuable thing of this project is having an image for our community. I feel that we all feel very proud of being from Manistee, but there hadn't been a, an actual logo that you could say, here, this is my Manistee and that's how I can represent it. Um, and then the last project, which is still on the works, it's the training for board governance. How can I provide more resources and materials to your local boards for more effective implementation, this decision making and communication. Um, I will leave this to Sarah because she's gonna talk about the housing action plan. Uh, I, I've done a lot of key events and activities in Manistee. They have been highly, super well attended. We've done numerous interviews. I've been really lucky to connect with most of the community members, asking me questions, how to connect with the city, how can we collaborate, which I think is a super positive thing. Uh, we hosted different branding and marketing focus groups, uh, a housing forum to kind of put the word out there on what is the housing issue in Manistee and how can we all be a part of the solution. The incentives training, the branding and marketing survey, the board, gov 
board governance survey, the branding reveal, the economic development presentation. Um, we have that MISTA training that it's gonna happen on October 22nd. I should start doing outreach for that too. It's gonna be a super good opportunity for any community member to hear about what's available as far as assistance for home rehab or home ownership. And I'm also working in with Sarah Lucas on a training for the county land bank to kind of use it also as a resource for economic development and housing. Um, I'll leave that to Sarah too. Overall, as, as, as you probably know, when you sign to be part of the program, the whole point of Rising Tide as a community is to, again, have a clear path for economic development and enhance intergovernmental relations. How can you as a community be a little bit of a step forward to get the ball rolling and continue to action and growing as a community? Um, and yeah, I think that's all I have for you. I would love any feedback or questions that you have for me. <laughs> feedback, questions? The, the plan is um, at the first meeting in October, we'd have something on your agenda and we're gonna request the council adopt the recommendations of the Project Rising Tide Steering Committee and the consultants, uh, especially the concept of Manistee Forward and go on record, we're asking the same thing of other uh, organizations in the community that we've been working with, the county, the chamber, the DDA, so everybody understands that, that we're committed and we're in this together and this is the direction we're gonna follow. So that'll be on your first uh, uh, meeting agenda in October. Anybody have any questions about that? All righty, thank you. I have a question. Sure. So, how long have you been here now? Um, nine months, and then I am done in three months from now. <laughs> so. Evaluate me from the, the point you, from the time you came here till now. Okay, give me an evaluation. Oh man, Roger. I put you on the spot, didn't I? <laughs> yes, you did. Well, I think things are moving slow and steady, but we can still do better with the communication. I feel that as a community, all of the leaders could really do better at being open and you know, leave micromanagement aside, rather being a team player and letting others lead you into a, a point of implementation and getting things done. One of the things I've observed here, in the, which is perfectly fine, there's a lot of conversation and talking that happens before <laughs> anything can be decided. I feel that one of the things that has been changing is the level of engagement too. Um, I've had a lot of buy-in from all of your community leaders. I feel that the next step is genuinely owning that engagement to being able to do something. So you might have started at a, I don't know, four, we're a seven, but I'm hoping that we reach at least a nine by the time I'm gone in December. So how's that? That's good, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Grandpa. Thank you. Next up, discussion on housing action plan. Ms. Sarah Lucas. Hi there, I'm Sarah Hi. Lucas from Housing North. I've been working with the City of Manistee and Rising Tide on the housing component of Rising Tide. Um, we put together, after a fairly lengthy input process, um, which some of you participated in, some of the interviews I conducted, some of you might have attended the forum that we held back in June, uh, we took all of that input and put that into the report that you, I think, received with your packet. I don't have a PowerPoint. I wasn't going to go through the report in detail, but just kind of wanted to give you an overview of what went into the, the recommendations, what went into um, the process itself, and what the next steps might be. So um, I work with a new organization called Housing North. Uh, we've been around since this winter, essentially. I've been there since January. Um, and our goals are focused on uh, over overcoming the barriers and addressing the barriers to housing development in our region because we know in all of our communities in Northwest Michigan there's a housing issue. Um, you saw the economic development focus areas, um, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Um, three of the four mentioned housing as an economic development issue. Um, so we know that there's um, this pervasive housing issue. We know we need to build more but for some reason it's not happening. So how can we how can we um, move out the square one to make that happen? 
So um, with that in mind, the Rising Tide group identified housing as something that they wanted to focus on. They asked, um, Beckett and Rader asked Housing North to provide assistance. And so we put together a scope of work that the Rising Tide group um, approved. Um, and that included that input process that was um, focused on one-on-one -on -one interviews with different community stakeholders. And I, I started that in the spring and talked with a lot of different community members. And I heard a lot of really consistent themes, which I think um, you see addressed in the report. A lot of it was, um, there was a lot of concern about housing quality. Um, there's a lot of concern about um, public awareness and engagement and support for housing and some of the, the dialogue that happens around it. Um, there's a lot of interest in uh, communicating the different needs for housing and um, which specifically which populations we're trying to serve with different housing developments, um, how we can access additional um, dollars and resources for housing development, and then um, how, we can, how we can put those projects together. So um, based on that input, we uh, provided some recommendations. Um, one of the, the first ones that I'll, I'll start with, um, because you, you see it in this um, first page of Manistee Vision and Goals for Housing. Uh, one thing that I heard over and over is um, this uh, disconnect between the housing shortage that's out there and people's perception of, of what needs to happen. And we've had a lot of conversation in Manistee about um, do we need senior housing? Um, if we have senior housing, is it just going to be a senior community? Do we need housing for young professionals? Um, do, we, do we need more rentals? It seems like we have this much. It seems like housing should be affordable to the people that live there. And I think um, there, there just needs to be some consensus about uh, what Manistee is looking for in terms of housing. So, Creating a housing vision, I, I thought, would be one way that um, everyone could kind of get behind a, a general statement about housing. It's pretty broad. Um, what I've recommended is a, a vision statement that says, diverse housing options are available in Manistee for residents of all ages, incomes, and household types in order to su support and grow a diverse local economy. And that came out of lots of conversations about how housing is impacting the business climate and uh, opportunities for growth in Manistee. And we know that it's difficult to recruit people to Manistee in part because of housing shortages. And I heard stories from young professionals who knew other young professionals who wanted to move here but they couldn't find a place to live. Um, so we know that we need um, those young people um, to fill these jobs that we have available. Um, but we also know, know that we need um, diverse housing options um, for, for the seniors who live here, um, for uh, the families we'd like um, to have in the community to um, support our schools, so we, we know that we need a, a broad range of housing types. So the, the recommendations are informed by that housing vision. The goals are broken into a, the few uh, focus areas that I mentioned. The first one being housing rehab, um, so addressing those housing quality issues. Um, I, I won't go through the, the goals in detail, but I will mention um, one, of the, one of the big um, recommendations is to establish a neighborhood enterprise zone. Not every community has the ability to um, pass that kind of policy, um, but what it is is essentially a tax incentive to, in to encourage um, new residential development and home renovation. Um, another idea or recommendation was to encourage banks to offer renovation mortgages, um, something that uh, some banks do um, just to get housing up to basically move in standards. Uh, one thing we heard a lot is that um, there's housing that's available and affordable, but it's nowhere near being in move-in condition for people who, who want to live there, but they can't get home renovations um, financed by, by their mortgage. So having those renovation mortgages might open up some new housing opportunities for some individuals. Uh, and then the third recommendation under housing rehabilitation is to apply for a neighborhood improvement grant that would um, provide actual dollars to homeowners to um, rehab their houses. Uh, the second chunk of recommendations is focused on communications and awareness, so it gets to kind of that public support and um, awareness issue. Um, there was a lot of conversation I, I heard about um, negativity in the uh, discussions about housing, um, and uh, again, just that disconnect between the housing shortages that we know are there and what people are um, willing to support and willing to recognize. 
So the recommendations are to be proactive with messaging, so understanding what the housing needs are and being able to communicate that to a broad population, um, engaging diverse um, populations in, in that messaging, and then uh, that shared, shared vision that I, that I read earlier. It's really just about having um, a conversation where everyone's starting from the same place. The third uh, set of recommendations is focused on process and capacity. We know that development is really complicated and that it's easy for it to go off the rails um, due to financing, due to public opposition, um, due to you know, a need for zoning changes, due to um, unwilling uh, uh, property owners. <laughs> um, there's any number of things that can um, jeopardize a proposal. And um, we have a, a few recommendations to hopefully streamline that development process a little bit to make it more enticing for developers to invest here in Manistee. Um, the first is to establish standard pilot procedures. Uh, um, pilots are payment in lieu of taxes. They're pretty standard in any affordable housing development uh, that, that moves forward. Um, they can be a, a flashpoint for uh, community opposition and um, some of that negative discussion that I mentioned. Um, so having some clear objective criteria <coughs> Uh, organize those conversations a little bit better so that you remain focused on the, on the issues um, rather than, than some of the speculation around housing development. Uh, another recommendation is to consider zoning changes that would, that would not necessarily encourage but at least allow different types of housing that's not currently allowed in the community. So things that have historically been just integral to residential neighborhoods, things like duplexes and granny flats and, um, you know, uh, townhomes or those small small courtyard apartments, small cottages, a lot of those types of housing aren't allowed anymore by zoning. Um, but they're the most in-demand housing types that we have on the housing market right now because our household sizes are shrinking so much. Um, so there were a number of zoning changes that were recommended to the Planning Commission, um, and that's a recommendation is that the, the city explore adoption of those zoning changes. And then the third process and capacity recommendation is to develop capacity for community development. And um, that sounds rather nebulous, um, but what it really gets to is that it's difficult to implement these recommendations and to proactively go after development and make the right kind of development happen in the community if you don't have someone basically with their eye on the ball. Um, so in a lot of larger communities, there's <coughs> community development staff, whether it's planning staff or whether they're actually assigned as community development staff um, that work with developers, that work with the community, that work with funders to bring all the different pieces of a development together and help, again, streamline that process and make it a little bit easier for the community and for the developer. One of the things that I hear from developers really consistently is that possibly the biggest barrier to development in rural areas and small towns is that there, are, there aren't enough staff to help them. There aren't staff at all in many cases to help them coordinate the development, bring all the partners to the table, line up the financing. They really want to have that local support. Um, and when it's, when it's there, they're more likely to, to want to invest in the community. Um, but beyond that, I think it is really important to consider if you, if you wanna move any of these recommendations forward, there has to be somebody who's you know, actually working on it consistently. Um, so that was a recommendation for how that might be structured as a shared position. The fourth set of recommendations is uh, based around funding and resources. Obviously, the biggest barrier in housing development is the money. It's expensive. Um, if you want it to be affordable to most of the workforce, there often needs to be some kind of incentive or subsidy. Um, so the, the recommendations here were really focused on how to improve access to those funding sources, um, the first recommendation is to improve readiness for those public funding sources, so understanding what goes into an application, what the city's role is, um, particularly around things like the payment in lieu of taxes. Um, that, again, is a community development function that uh, a staff person uh, could, could own, I guess. Um, a second recommendation is a little bit longer term, more pie in the sky, but again, could be really impactful, and that's to provide gap financing for developers. Some communities have what are called housing trust funds, where they can provide, you know, the, the, what they call the first in. <laughs> they can be the first in in terms of funding and that, you know, providing a small grant or a, a revolving loan to a developer makes it easier for that developer to access financing and leverage a lot more dollars for development. 
So that gap funding um, is something that the community as a whole could explore longer term. Um, a third recommendation is to build up and leverage the land bank authority. Lizette mentioned that we're planning a land bank authority workshop uh, in October. It's October 17th, I think, in the morning. And um, really, land bank authorities are, are pretty flexible um, entities that can bring a lot of tools to the table for housing development. And um, there's there's a lot of, um, I, th I think, opportunity to, and to enhance the tools that you have to offer developers by, by working with land bank authorities. Uh, a fourth recommendation is focused on the Housing Commission, which is an important partner in housing development in the city, and just making sure that there's um, communication and an understanding of what respective roles are related to the Housing Commission and how they might be able to act as a partner in housing development. And finally, and most importantly, the last recommendation is to initiate development activity, which is, is just what it sounds. Um, we had a number of conversations about specific development sites and opportunities. Um, there are a number of developers that are interested in opportunities to build housing in, in the city of Manistee. I think housing, or I think Manistee is, has an enormous amount of potential for new development and redevelopment. And I think that there's a lot of momentum in terms of um, your redevelopment ready uh, uh, status in terms of rising tide. The state is paying attention to what you're doing. Um, there are you know, willing development partners. So being able to bring all of those forces together um, shouldn't be that much of a stretch. Um, with the right site, with the right, um, with the right partners, uh, we can make that happen. So we've had a number of conversations about uh, bringing all those pieces together. Um, next steps, um, uh, like Thad mentioned, um, this will be, um, I think, up for approval at one of your next meetings. Yep. Um, Lisa is here for another three months only. Um, but she's been really great to work with and is um, ready to uh, get started on any of, any of the recommendations that you move forward with. All of these uh, recommendations, if this document is approved, the, you know, the devil's always in the details, so more detailed proposals would come to you as they're, as they're developed. Um, and I think one of the, the higher priority items that we identified was that neighborhood enterprise zone um, because it's a low investment, potentially very high return, um, could bring a lot of benefits to both homeowners and um, create new investment opportunities in the city of Manistee. So that's something that um, we would be, be looking at in the near term. And again, like, the, like we said, the Land Bank Authority workshop is in October. So I, that was just a, a quick uh, overview, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have, um, both about the report and about some of the, the housing needs that I, I kind of glossed over. <laughs> any questions? Have you looked over what, what land is available in Manistee? Mm -hmm. We had a lot of discussions on that. Um, everyone I talked with, we uh, went, kind of went through a list of um, what were considered to be prime development and redevelopment opportunities, and there were a few that rose to the top. Um, so, and, and I think that there's interest on the part of some investors um, and developers on those sites. Manistee is in a good position because it's a redevelopment ready community, which means that the MEDC is, is willing to entertain more proposals, essentially. Um, and I think Manistee is still the only RRC community in Northwest Michigan that has actually identified redevelopment ready sites, which is a big criteria for MEDC dollars. So those would be the those would be the priority locations. Yes. Did you have an area where you were looking for the neighborhood enterprise zone? Maxwell Town was the one that everyone mentioned. So that was what we recommended to start with as a pilot. Any other questions? If you could pick something to get done in a reasonable amount of time, what would you pick for us to do? Well, I think the neighborhood enterprise zones is something that could happen fairly quickly and again have, have a big return. The other thing, and this is maybe a little bit more strategic, is um, considering that capacity is issue. And so whether or not you wanna structure um, an actual staffing position, whether that's shared or otherwise, to make sure the rest of these recommendations move forward. Um, Outside of that, I would say the neighborhood enterprise zone, the um, staffing, and um, the pilot 
is something that could happen quickly. That that pilot approval criteria. Um, there are a lot of models from other communities that we can kind of borrow from, um, and again, is something that could happen with with important impacts to developers. It's a good question. Anything else? Thank you, sir. Okay. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to work with Manistee. I um, enjoyed all my conversations with the, the stakeholders here, and I just have to say I'm, I'm really impressed by all the, the passion in this community and the desire to get things done, and I'm hopeful that I can continue to help you move things forward. We, we appreciate your input and your time. Thank you. 64. Discussion on pool agreement. Kowalski. Yes. For the last year, we knew this agreement was coming up. I've been told by people, don't touch it. Uh, I'm ruining it for the kids. And I just feel that something needs to be done with the complaints that we get from people, and I'm sure everybody's got a copy of it, uh, people complaining about, and I've heard it from a lot of people, about nobody's collecting the money, nobody's at the door. Uh, I know people who've been in the pool and been kicked out, uh, older people, uh, locker rooms are damp, uh, inaccurate record keeping. I mean, what's being done to take care of this? I mean, you want 10000 or $40,000 from us, Ask why don't we put this into a millage rather than uh, the city trying to save money to do roads and all this other million dollars on piping and sewage. Uh, there's a lot of money going out and, and we're getting all these complaints from people. Anybody can answer it, I'd be happy. I both know Mr. Stoneman, a lot of people are afraid to call, you know, so they call us and we get stuck with the complaint. So, so then, then you communicate to us, we don't have to use names, but something yeah. happened yesterday or last week, I learned about this and you should know about that. And then we can address it, maybe not exactly on who it was that it was affected with, uh, but we can address the time period and, and uh, uh, what the, the issue or the complaint is. Lifeguards up there all the time when the pool's open. Yeah. Uh, Corey Up is the uh, pool director. He answered yes. Because this lady says right here that nobody was at the pool, nobody was taking money, uh, and I think Mr. Shemansky responded to her. Just appreciate her over the Says it's a beautiful asset, and everybody agrees. And 
a lot of people like to use it, but I mean, she's got a lot of complaints with her. Uh, something is wrong with her, something. Well, again, uh, communications will help on both ends of that. And uh, if we don't know about it, uh, we can help in the moment. And that's really important that we can respond in a timely way. Otherwise, the experts are going to get upset and we're doing nothing. So we need to know about it before we get one of those experts in. I have a just throwing this out there, I thought at one time we were going to talk to the MRA or maybe the MRA was going to try to get involved with helping to, um, helping the community pool process. I don't know whether there's any savings that can be done, whether they'd be interested. I'm just wondering if bringing somebody in like that a part, as a partner um, to help with the staffing, taking the money, making sure the locker rooms are clean or whatever needs to be done there. Um, I don't know if there's any interest, but, <laughs> and I don't know whether it's been discussed at the MRA level either. So I'm not on that board anymore. Well, as it happens, we just lost the director of the MRA, so probably not at the moment. Probably not at the moment. Well, maybe that's an opportunity too at the same time. I don't know. I, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Grabowski. Um, I'm disappointed uh, that we've seen a number of complaints, but the complaints that I've seen that he is referring to, I believe, are the same ones that we got just before we passed our budget. So we did speak openly about them, and I don't, uh, I guess I, I need to know for sure that they've been resolved. And I think that would make me feel better rather than, rather than saying, oh yeah, the next time we get one, we'll talk to you, and then approving a $40,000 item. I think I need to know what's been done since we've brought up these complaints before to tighten it up. We did have quite a quite a lively discussion about this, and you all present, so about the complaints uh, when we talked about the, the contract. So um, I just want to know. I mean, that's been months, so I'm curious. What have you done to change things? I would like to see some numbers on that. I want to see how many people are actually using the pool uh, outside of the students during their, you know, required time to use it or swim meets. Has any any other agency come forward to want to help and besides Manatee, Filer, and Strani uh, about Manatee Township? I mean, I know there are kids come in from out there when they swim and not on school. I just talked to a mother and she didn't pay at all. I agree, they should be paying the, the six dollars or whatever, but she said she didn't pay a dime. The kids just went in. So, I mean, the kids are getting through there. I think all, 
what we're referring to are two letters that we received in the last two months. I got more than that. Okay, so there's two main ones that I know of and have listed out um, their concerns. If we were to put this, compile these lists together and send it to you guys and for you to reply back to what we're doing to correct these or addressing these issues, I think I, for me, I would feel a lot better of seeing what these, um, the responses are. I have a question on the management. Yeah. Um, it, it's all about customer service. When people come in and there's a group of kids using the pool, does the attendant who's taking the money take and spend any time saying, you can use the pool, we've got two lanes open. They're at such and such part of the pool. Do they take the time to do that or they just take the money and then the people have to try to figure it out for themselves? I just, I, I, I've had, I've had two that I've passed on, but um, my, the new ones I'm not aware of, anything new. So I agree, I think that we should be funneling all of our complaints for Mr. Taylor, let him follow up on when he get back with us, so that we should present. Yes, Mr. Taylor. I think in the, in the, in all fairness, um, I, I've been in a position where I've had to oversee uh, community pools at several different military installations, so I can, I, I know some of the um, and again, and I don't think we've uh, mentioned the fact that I have also received a, a number of compliments and people who truly appreciate having the community pool as well. It's not all negative. Uh, there are a lot of people who think 
and, and probably rightly so, that you do a great job trying to balance the, all those different needs. I think people who don't use the pool don't understand there's, there really are almost diametric forces at work. Uh, you know, kids want to play in the pool. And then you have other people who want to have exercise classes. You have other ones who just want to swim laps. Well, sometimes you can't get it all done at the same time in the same pool at the same time. So again, part of that, I, I, I literally understand. Uh, the, the financial part, there's probably some, some opportunities to look at some new technologies. I know that we've had similar situations where, where we've looked at automated systems to help with managing pool entry uh, with, with slide cards and things. And especially when you're using your volunteers to augment a um, couple of comments on, you know, lifeguard training and, you know, how, how are they uh, positioned, what are they supposed to do and when. But the big thing, I think, is the communication. You know, having, having the hotline sign so if somebody does see something that is not so much the, to me, the issues with, you know, hey, I wanted to do this and you were doing that, but if there are safety concerns, that those be immediately addressed, that we have a way of being able to pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, there's nobody on the, you know, on the lifeguard station at this time, or, or whatever the issue may be, if, they, if they're considered to be uh, you know, life safety. But overall, like I said, uh, people don't realize how many factors are involved, chlorinations, and especially in indoor pool, you have all kinds of other factors involved with, with keeping that, that water safe uh, and, and keeping people trained. And, and again, it's, it's not an easy task. So the, the city does, I think, benefit from a community pool. And, and I do appreciate the fact that you are the people responsible for providing that. Uh, my personal belief is $40,000 is a drop in the bucket. Um, I know what the chemical costs probably are that high. Well, I kind of thought, well, I don't know whether I'll say this, but I'm gonna say it. When I hear people complain a lot, what I get from the complaint is, it's not about how their pool is run so much. It's about the $40,000. They, they just don't think that we should be spending $40,000 on the pool. Now, I don't hear a lot of complaints. I actually hear more good than I hear bad. Um, my wife attends a pool, and she'd be really up front if there was something going on, and I don't get any complaints from her. So I'm, I'm not opposed to the pool. There are a couple of things I'd like to see happen. I would like to see more communication, maybe a quarterly report, a six-month report, what's going on, what's happening. I believe in accountability. I think we have an obligation if we're gonna spend $40,000 to be accountable to the taxpayers, for what's going on. Um, the other question I had was in reference to the additional contri contri contributors. Has there been any movement to like go to Filer Township, Man or Filer's already in Manistee Township, any of those other townships? Have I'm not talking about so much how many people, I'm talking about how many people paid, how many didn't as part of a report, but I wanna know the activities. What kind of, did you have swim meets? Um, those types of things to bring people up to speed on actually what's going on. I don't really know what goes on there. I, I, you know, I, and I think it's important that everybody know that, 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 that this, is really a, this is really active and really alive and moving forward and things are well. Anyway, I would like to I would like to see a more um, something written in that we had a report, um, some type of an activity report. I don't know how Mr. Taylor has any input on that. We can certainly add it. 
make the request to be added to the agreement. And I'm not necessarily saying you have to come before council, but it could be part of our council ad attachments that there be a report made. Um, and if we have any questions, of course, we can get a hold of you, that type of thing. Um, go ahead. Yeah. I got a question. You're coming before the people asking for about $30 million. There's nowhere in that $30 million that you can squeeze $40,000 toward the pool? We could spend about $700,000 on that pool if the pool has to fail. Correct? Yep. That's it. And if the pool fails, we can always call them. Excuse me. I'm sorry about it. How about if you put, when you come before the people for the $30 million, have a clause on the bottom of who wants the pool and who doesn't want the pool? Let the people decide if they want to spend $40,000 on the pool. I'm not just one I do. I know that, but you're only one person. Yes, so are you. I just think it's very important that there are a lot of things we spend money on that make Manistee very unique and special, and the pool is, to me, is one of those. Um, I would like to see it continue, like Mr. Savansky mentioned forty thousand dollars. Did you say a drop in the bucket? Is that what you said? Well, literally, <laughs> for running a yeah, pool. Yeah, uh, uh, the drop, drop in the bucket to running the pool. pool. I think it's a great asset for our community. Um, that's just my opinion. Well, I'm not sure. Is there I anybody know. else? Well, I, I think seeing some more numbers would be helpful. And and I come from communities who've had who have community pools, but they're really. I don't know how to say this. They just seem to have been so well organized that um, nobody slips through the doors, nobody gets in the pool without being checked in. Um, it's just it's it's just different here, some in some ways. So I uh, I would rather see numbers of the people that are actually using the pool outside of no, normal school activities. I know. Uh, Mayor Zielinski would like to see the school activities, but I'd like to see a breakdown. Um, I want to see if those numbers are climbing or whether they're declining. So that's where my interest is in the numbers. What I can do is I can work with the schools to, you know, get them to, if you can get me any complaints you've received about the pools, I'll get that to them. And then maybe uh, the next time we bring it back to council as an action item, we'll have those responses to how, you know, those questions about the usage and how did you deal with these complaints? It'll be all in front of you. Any other questions? Concerns, comments? Thank you very much for responding, gentlemen. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, strategic plan, Mr. Taylor. It's uh, in your packet. It's the normal quarterly update, uh, the new any new activities um, are in red. And I'm not gonna belabor and go through it point by point. I will answer any questions if council has them on individual uh, initiatives and what we've done since the last time we discussed. Well, we'll have to read it over because I think we just got it. Maybe we could have a, a couple of minutes at the next council meeting to sure, yeah. ask some it. questions. Okay. All right. um, would I mean is next council meeting too soon, or you, would you? Do you want to do it the next work session? Would that be too late? No, it's it's council's prerogative. I'd like to do it on the work session next. Yeah, okay. Give us more time. To yeah. Right. We really need time to digest that. Next on the agenda, discussion on how medical and recreational marijuana permits will be awarded. Mayor Pro Tem led the meeting. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna talk for a few minutes. Um, I've spent a lot of time looking into this. Uh, uh, <coughs> selection of the provisioning centers. Beyond passing the ordinances for the number of marijuana licenses, City Council doesn't have much say in who gets a license to operate in the city. The state has to do their due diligence on new provisioning centers and it appears most of the, most of the 11 that the Planning Commission has received and introduced publicly 
those of those both want to do both medical and recreational sales. The state will begin a, accepting license requirements in November, first for the first time for recreational sales. However, those that have medical provisioning licenses already will get preferential treatment over those that do not. Existing medical provisioning licenses held elsewhere in the state of Michigan in the state of Michigan count towards that. So in other words, they they anticipate a big number, an avalanche of these requests. And those that have passed all the, the checks and balances in getting a medical one and apply for a recreational one, they're gonna be able to process those ahead of the, the other people that are just now beginning the process of asking for a recreational license. Um, we have a small number of applicants that have already, that already, that have applied uh, in the, the medical district, or in the marijuana district that hold medical licenses in the state. I, out of the 11 that I have seen, and I've gone to all the planning commission meetings, 11 of, of the presentations I've seen, three of them, I believe, actually hold these licenses. The rest of them have all been pre-qualified, uh, for the license, but they don't actually hold the license yet. Um, so, uh, applicants who have applied early, by the way, have had the advantage of going back and forth to the Planning Commission to provide them with more information because the Planning Commission had made a decision based on recommendations from the Planning Department to hold a big meeting on August 15th to hear all of them. Um, these applications that they got started as early as June 10th, that was the earliest date that I've seen on an application. Um, so newer applications have come in and some of them have, been, have had more complete, complete information than the earlier ones and the early ones had chance, opportunities to go back and forth to the planning department to, to make theirs look better if they had gaps. Additionally, after the planning commission makes their recommendations, the city has to do their due, due diligence. I am concerned with some of the investors who, and I'm just going to put it out there, so, uh, the internet is a wonderful tool if you're looking for information. Um, there are some people that have federal liens or they haven't paid their taxes on property on some of the names that are on the applications. That is a concern to me to tell you right up front that I hope that we have a rule or establish a rule in the city since they have to renew their license yearly that if they haven't paid their taxes here you know I don't don't so much care about what's going on in other districts other than it raises a flag but if they haven't paid their taxes here I don't want them to have a license I don't want their license renewed that's that's my opinion on those taxes because I've also noticed that bankrupt, bankruptcy has become an acceptable way of life for some people. And I see that in real estate all the time. Well, you know, hey, you know, doesn't, it doesn't seem to have the social stigma that it used to have a long time ago. But I think sometimes we have to be conscious of the fact that there may be some of these people that have bankruptcies in their, in their past. Um, I also hope that when the state is doing their due diligence on looking at these people, that they would not grant licenses to people who have committed a felony. Uh, I've, I've been schooled on this a little bit in that I've been told that there's a lot of felonies that the state's gonna, gonna allow, so they're gonna be able to get a license, and I, I'm a little bit concerned about that. It makes me nervous, it's our community, this is where we live, this is our town, um, and this is what we're going to possibly be encountering. The Planning Commission um, has put their site plan approvals on hold in the district. My recommendation would be that they go ahead with the approval process regardless of this whole new problem that they've encountered about trying to make a common driveway throughout the district. Anyone granted a site plan approval will be contingent, should be contingent on participating in the common driveway. To do so at this time without properties actually yet changing hands from sellers to buyers 
will be a nightmare in waiting for a plan that may or may not include them all. New surveys need to be requested, new legal descriptions need to be written, title work would change. It's, it's gonna be a nightmare. I think it's just easier to just deal with it after the property has changed hands. If everyone who has applied so far is granted site approval, they still need the state to investigate the property physically and sales and transfer of title needs to happen then. Keep in mind, they all should have the medical provisioning license or they will be waiting a while for the state to process application for the recreational sales after November 1st. I have voted favorably for marijuana sales in the city because that's what the people want. However, however this is all new and marijuana is still classified as a Schedule One drug, which means the federal government views it as a highly, highly addictive and having no medical value. I believe that that will change over time. I, and I do believe that there is some medical value to it, but that's my opinion. And you are probably, might not be able to convince me on the, the number of licenses to be granted, but I do think it is time for us to revisit the ordinance that uh, up on the number of recreational licenses in the city. I would like to bring that back before council. I think anywhere from five to seven licenses for that would be um, appropriate. We have to keep in mind that the people that are coming in there are gonna clean up the properties. It's gonna look a night nicer. I don't think three will have much of an impact. And, and then I'm done talking. So anybody wants to jump in? Are you asking to have that put on the agenda? Um, sure. And I'm asking Mr. Taylor if you'd like to jump in and say anything. Just a couple of comments. Um, what I've gotten from the planning department is, is that the majority of the people that are going through the special use permit process either have a medical marijuana license or they've been pre-qualified for a license. Only three and of them have the license, right? Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> but the majority of them either have the license or are pre-qualified. So anyhow, I, I called uh, Lara, which is the licensing agent, and I, because I didn't know, and I asked, what's the difference between having a medical light, med medical marijuana license and being pre-qualified? And, and it just boils down to an inspection of a, of a building that they wanna use. So those people that have a medical marijuana license are operating in another community, have been vetted, had their building inspected, they get a license. The ones that have been pre-qualified have gone through all the vetting. The, the, the state has approved them short of inspecting their building. So I look at them as almost the same. You know, that, that even if, you know, the people that already have a license for medical marijuana, that's valid where they're operating now for them to operate here, they're still gonna to have to go through an inspection. So both of them are in the same spot in my mind. So um, I know the, that we're meeting tomorrow to talk uh, about this connectivity of the properties and uh, it's not really gonna be an access road, it's just gonna be how do you get from one parking lot to the other? So we can have that interconnectivity as opposed to a, a, a drive that the city would have to maintain. So we're gonna talk about that on, on what the best process is gonna be. Be We're going to um, um, meet with the planning department as well as the city attorney. Heather and I are gonna sit in on the, um, on the meeting. We're gonna go once more through our process. And this, this time we're gonna mostly focus on when those applicants are gonna have what they need from the planning uh, department, from the planning uh, commission so they can come to the city and, and, and ask to get an application to complete for a license. So, um, you know, we, we've, we're just fine tuning it and uh, that, that's where we're at right now. Um, personally, I, you know, I think we have controls, we have a good application that we're asking people to complete. Uh, we share the same concerns that uh, was raised by Mayor Pro Tem Beaton is that it's our community, we want, we want the right people in here. Um, 
so that was a driving force when we when we put together that application. And remember too that that the, our licenses are good for a year; they have to be renewed. So you know that there, we have a lot of checks and balances. And I'm of the opinion if people are going to invest thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in buying property, uh, renovating property, getting all the permits from the state and from us, I don't think they're they're setting themselves up to fail. But that said, we have that year to monitor them if they haven't complied with the inspections that they're supposed to have. They're delinquent on taxes. You know, those things can be taken into consideration when they come back to renew and get a second license. So I, I'm, I'm convinced we have enough checks and balances between our local process and most importantly, the state that does the, the primary vetting. I, I think we're gonna be okay. Another question, Mr. Taylor. If a, if, I don't, upon a renewal of a license every year, if somebody weren't paying their bills, would that be a reason not to renew it? I'm referring to like taxes, that type oh, of thing. Yeah, if, 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 if the city's not getting their taxes, why do we wanna encourage somebody to continue yeah. to operate and not pay us, yeah. Okay. Just a point, just real quick, just to make sure I'm, I'm not wrong and we don't step ourselves, kick ourselves in the hand. I think, and Robert Caruso orders, you can't request this because you were not part of the prevailing decision. If somebody, the prevailing can only bring back up a decision or that was made. And because it was voted down, it would have to be one of the four prevailing. I just wanna make get that clarified. So somebody else may hit on the council of prevailing just to make sure we're staying in Robert's rules. Right. We, I ran that by our city attorney and he said, that his opinion and the one he's used is that this is a piece of legislation and it's not subject to rule or Robert's rules of order. Cause I had the same concern. And he said, he, he said, because it's a piece of legislation, anybody on the council can bring it up. Okay, I just wanna yeah. make sure. Yeah. But it's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Is there anything else? Then just to be clear, we'll add this to uh, next week's meeting. For discussion next week yeah uh, so no do we do we have anybody who has any thoughts on what the number of them should be I, I still think that that five micro businesses and five retail uh, with the unlimited uh, medical is pretty much filling up that pretty much fill up that site. I think seven would be better, but I, there's 21 parcels out there. Five and seven, we can get our six. We'll, we'll bring it back and council can thoroughly <laughs> discuss it. Is there any other council members? I do agree with um, Deaton about um, trying to get the property sold and then deal with the issue of um, driveway. Because right. there's a lot of moving parts to that and I think that's gonna really I think what we're trying to do is get it through the, get that action through the planning commission to get the prospective owners or if they do own it already to agree as part of the special use permit because we have a little bit more leverage there as opposed to they get their special use permit and then we're coming back and say make this connected and we have no leverage. If they say no, they say no. And, and just just the reason for this is we're trying to work with Mishta on eliminating a lot of the road cuts because if you look at their street, I mean, there's there's one right after the other after the other. So we're, we're trying to minimize the road cuts going in and out of that property. And that's why some of the issues with how do I get to my property because I'm kind of crossing a no man's land. So that's that's the whole issue that, yeah. that became involved in that. And are the owners have to agree to go into They've all the, the the verbal agreements have all been made in public. The problem is how do you get that Well the the, the big issue and we're gonna be discussing tomorrow is how are those points of connection determined? Right. And so, you know, we're gonna have the discussion 
does, does the city want to front the money for a surveyor to go in and say this, this is where they're going to be and then collect the money from the property? I mean, that's just a process question. So we're going to be discussing that. It's just a matter of deciding where those are. And again, you're right. The, everything I hear from the applicants is they're okay with that. It's just getting the process together. Anything else? Council, I have one thing. Um, when we were looking at that, the numbers earlier tonight, we realized that there has been a calculation error on that spreadsheet. Which so one? The one on the refuse. Okay. So what we would like to do is um, go through those numbers again with the fine tooth comb. We had three sets of eyes looking at them and none of us caught it. And bring that back at a future work session with, with the, pro the proper numbers. Because I think it'll make a difference and perhaps some perspectives on that. So I, I want to apologize for that. We, none of us caught it when we were going through it, but it was a formula error that we need to correct and bring that back. And we'll have a little bit more of a narrative with it as well and get that to you in advance of the work session so you can look at it. I think it'll be a more productive discussion. Thank you so much. For you're, that. you're welcome. Anything else, Council? Um, I just have one personal note to make. Um, recently, I had um, mother's worst nightmare. Um, my child came up missing with a babysitter for an hour. And I just have to thank our community. Um, I was able to get him back. Um, and the, um, the fire department, department really stepped up and calmed me and um, got my child back home. So um, we live in a really great community, even you know the neighborhood and everything like that. So um, I want to thank, publicly thank our police department I got a little kick on that one too. Last night, or my son's got pneumonia. He's got asthma, really bad. And uh, guys came out at 110 just, just to evaluate him. He didn't complain one bit. I told him he didn't have to take it, and then I appreciate it. Just want to say thanks, guys. Anybody? Seeing none, we're adjourned.